I'm Aletha Houston, and uh, I am privileged to introduce Dr. Alan E. Guttmacher. Dr. Guttmacher became the director of the Eunice, Shriver, Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development after being acting director of the institute beginning in December 2009. He's a pediatrician and a medical geneticist. He came to the National Institutes of Health in 1999 to work at the National Human Genome Research Institute, where he served in a number of roles, including seven years as the deputy director and from August 2008 to December 2009 as acting director. He oversaw the Institute's efforts to advance genome research, integrate that research into healthcare, and explore the ethical, legal, and social implications of human genomics. Dr. Guttmacher came to the NIH from the University of Vermont, where he directed the Vermont Regional Genetic Center and Pregnancy Risk Information Service, the v Vermont Newborn Screening Program, and the Vermont Cancer Center's Familial Cancer Program. He founded Vermont's only pediatric intensive care unit and was the principal investigator for an NIH-supported initiative that was the nation's first statewide effort to involve the general public in discussion of the human genome project's ethical, legal, and social implications. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. He completed an internship and residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in medical genetics at Harvard and Children's Hospital of Boston. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. His talk today was titled, A Vision for the Future of Child Development Research. We're very privileged to have Dr. Guttmacher. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. As far as I know, despite it being April Fool's Day, it was all true, you asked before. Um, at least my mother tells me it is, and whatever she says goes. It's a, it really is a pleasure to be here with you and to, I hope, open a discussion with some of you. It's a discussion we've already started having, but some of you will be new to the discussion about what are the future opportunities for research. I'm going to sketch out a couple that I think in terms of a scientific vein, and then I'm going to talk about how together we might get there. So I'm going to open by, if you talk to this group and someone's just said, you, gee, you spent your life in a genomics institute, you're a geneticist, you better tackle nature versus nurture because otherwise people will think you've never heard of that or something. So I'm going to talk about that very briefly, then talk a bit about genetic influences, then talk about environmental influences, and then this community crafts a scientific vision. That's you in case you're wondering what community I'm speaking about. And then we'll, we hope to save some time for your questions and thoughts. So nature versus nurture. Well, it's obvious, of course, that it's neither. It's both. And it's obvious now, um, some years ago it wasn't so obvious, of course. And there may be a few people that still think it's one or the, or the other, but I think we have rather convincing evidence at this point that it really is both. So what that we know it's both? The challenge, of course, is for us to understand both nature and nurture, it would have been easier if it was only one, then we'd only have one to figure out, but it's both. And my argument would be that we really now have unparalleled ability because of new tools and new knowledge to be able to look at each of them. But then the more important challenge is to figure out the interactions between them. It's not just enough to know something about nature, something about nurture, we need to know how the two interact. And then, of course, while that's more important, most important is actually be able to use that knowledge in a way that we know improves the lives of children. That's a lot to get done. So let me say a little about the genetic influences and why, do, why am I optimistic that we have new approaches, new tools to think about those. This is uh, basically uh, back in 2002, uh, some of us who were at the Genome Institute um, were sitting down there was a conversation a couple of us were having with Francis Collins when he was then head of the Genome Institute, now the head of the NIH, and we were saying, gee, wouldn't it be nice? The problem with genetics is that we've always used the candidate gene approaches. We've guessed what gene is involved in some disease process, in some cognitive process, and then we go to see, gee, is there a variation in this gene for people who seem to have 
some disease state or some cognitive deficit compared to those who don't. And almost never did we find anything because, in fact, the genome and our bodies and minds are much too complex for us to be able to figure it out. So this candidate gene thing almost never worked. We said, let's take an agnostic approach. How if we looked across the whole genome without guessing ahead of time and looked where does the genome vary between those with some disease state or some cognitive deficit versus those who don't have that? And then once we found where it varied, we could focus in there to try to identify the genes. So we said, that's a nice idea. Let's do that. So we kind of priced it out. I won't go through all the steps. But to do that for a single disease, for a single kind of condition back in 2002 was only $10 billion. So we thought, well, why don't we do that? At that point, the NIH budget was something like two and a half times that. We could go around to all the other institutes and say, why don't you give us like 40, 50 percent of your money? We'll do this for one condition, and there's about a one in 10 chance it will happen to be a condition that's actually of interest to your institute. So we thought about that. Um, it was on, done on the back of an envelope. We put the envelope back in the drawer, said no more of that kind of ideation, and just forgot it for a while. But then some stuff happened. And over the next five years, purely really because of technologic innovation, I won't go through all the math of this, but the price of that $10 billion study had gotten down to about $800,000. At that point, with an NIH budget in the mid-20 billion, you could say, well, gee, maybe it does make sense to do that. So that was the birth of so-called genome-wide association studies. And this is a map of uh, all the human chromosomes. And it shows over there on the left, you'll see chromosome one, one little tag thing. That's for adult onset macular degeneration, the first or second leading cause of severe vision loss in, in our population. And that's a specific gene that was found through this genome-wide association project. So that's nice. We had one gene that somebody had found. Well, things got a little in 2006. There were several, so things had accelerated. In 2007, they accelerated enough that we're doing this just by the quarter of the year. And then in 2008, things really started to pick up. In 2009, so that's where we stood as of three months ago. I'm sorry, since the first quarter of the year ended yesterday, I should by now have the picture of where we are today. Um, but to be honest, every time, about every quarter now, the poor artist, a guy named Daryl Leisure, who does this, has to completely blow it up and start over because he can't get more points on the diagram. <laughs> Uh, there are now hundreds of genes that have been associated with specific kinds, and this is a list of the conditions in which have been involved in this. So we have gone in only from 2005 when there was one, and we knew a few genes involved in sort of common conditions, and these are fairly common ones, the vast majority before then. We knew literally a few, someplace between five and ten, and now we know hundreds, and all of that has happened in that five-year period. So that's great. Now, I should tell you, genome-wide association sites have limitations in that they don't explain most of heredity for any specific disease they've looked at, but they tell us a heck of a lot about biological processes. Once you know that variations in a gene can cause a specific disease state, it tells you about the basic biology of that disease in ways you would never have suspected. That first example I gave of adult onset macular degeneration, for instance, it turns out that three different genes are implicated through this and being involved. They're all involved in inflammation. Nobody, almost nobody thought of, of AMD as a disease of inflammation before this happened. We thought it was a disease of senescence or a vascularization. It's about inflammation. Well, we've got these things called anti-inflammatories. Maybe they might be helpful in not just treating, but maybe even preventing the disease, particularly for the fairly large part of the population that we know has genetic variations to put the increased risk for developing that. So for hundreds of different disease states, people are beginning to look at that. Luckily, that's not the only sort of genome um, trick that we have, the only new tool that we've got because of increased knowledge and this in continuing um, decrease in cost for technology. This is just for genome sequencing. There are lots of different graphs you could show. But we in the, gene, in the genome community, people used to pat themselves in the back and say, gee, we're obeying Moore's law, you know, of computing power, how every 22 months the price goes down in half and that kind of stuff in getting new genomic technology. It turns out the genome community was underselling itself because uh, Moore's law is the black line. It's a logarithmic curve. It's the red line that's the price of genome sequencing. It went down 14,000 fold over that decade of 1999 to 2009. Now, since then, 
that slope, to be honest, I should tell you that slope has changed. It's fallen actually much more dramatically in the year since then because they're completely new technologies, so-called next generation technologies that have come online. So there are many things in terms of genetics and genomics, both in terms of understanding, but simply the ability to be able to use the stuff because it's gotten cheap enough that's becoming quite common. That's great. But what we need to do, and there have been a number of talks at this meeting about this, is we need to be able to begin to use this more effectively in understanding child development. Most of those things that are up there are all about human disease states. They're not about child development. We need to be able to be thinking, as many people in this room are, about how we use these tools to look at that. Well, that's great. What about the nurture part? Is there any hope on that landscape? Because genetics really is the easy part in a lot of ways, I think. Um, the environmental part is much trickier. It's much more of a challenge to be able to measure it, to be able to observe it. It's much more dynamic than our genome is. We used to think the genome wasn't dynamic at all. It turns out, of course, it is, largely because of environmental exposure, so-called epigenomics, the way the environment, in fact, modifies the genome. We were talking last night, some people used to be very upset at the idea that actually the genome had anything to do with behavior, or et cetera. Well, the good news, even if you still feel that way for some philosophic reason, is it turns out the environment changes the genome. So that's the comeuppance or something at the end anyway. But we need to be able to figure that out. We need to be able to, despite the challenge of this, to figure out the environmental stuff besides the fact that even in the age of the genome, the genome era, it's not people's genome that we're going to change based upon this knowledge. It's their environment that we're going to have to alter if we want to actually improve kids' lives. So we really need to understand this much better, let alone this genome-environment interaction. Was well, there any hope for doing that? There are lots of things that are happening in terms of one major effort, and many of you are well aware of this, many of you have been involved in this, but just for those of you who aren't, we believe that we will be launching next year. It depends a little bit on the federal budget. Some of you may have heard there have been some questions recently about the federal budget. Thank you for inviting me to speak while the government was still open. Um, you think it's a joke, actually, a week from now. I've got two talks scheduled. I may not be able, I haven't had the guts to tell them yet that I may not come. Um, that, uh, but the National Children's Study, soon we get the, uh, the budget we expect. We expect to be starting the main study in, or, uh, basically around this time next year. And it's going to be a longitudinal study of 100,000 kids followed from before birth all the way to the age of 21, getting copious data about environmental exposures, about phenotypic things, about their development. Lots of developmental um, things will be assessed over that time, uh, time span, as well as a number of biospecimens gathered. Right now, there's a Vanguard study out that's just sort of proving the methodologies, et cetera, that will gather about three or 4,000 kids. The main study, if you think about 100,000 children, that's the kind of incidence you'd expect to see in 100,000 kids. So you can see there are a number of developmental issues that a population of 100,000, if we get the right kind of data together, ought to be able to help us think about. It's a lot of kids to have good data about. So one of the basic principles of the National Children's Study will be sharing the data as widely and as quickly as possible. It doesn't matter whether you're supported by the NCS or not. The data is going to be put out there for anybody to analyze, to use, to supplement their own studies, however they want to do it. So if you haven't already, start thinking about how you might be able to use data that will enroll the kids over about a four-year period so the data will start coming out. How could you use that in your own work? So now I want to, to spend most of my time really talking with you about where do we go from here, just in terms of what kinds of science might be in the horizon. So at NICHD, we decided uh, oh, almost a year ago that we should really focus on thinking about what the scientific opportunities of the next 10 years are. We picked 10 years because that's as far out as we thought we could go and be bound by any kind of sense of reality, and we wanted to be reality-based. At the same time, we wanted to be ambitious, push ourselves, push the field. So to think, what are the kinds of scientific opportunities of the next 10 years?